All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to uh, to listen to the presentation today. You know, I know economics is also known as the dismal science, and this reputation is often well earned, and it's hard to make economics interesting. But I hope uh, you won't be feeling too dismal at the end of my talk today. Now, I'm assuming my audience are all mining people, if not technical professionals, at least, uh, at least familiar with the industry. And I'm assuming that most attendees are from the mineral processing, metallurgy end of the technical spectrum, rather than mining engineers or geologists. And um, I'm assuming a certain level of familiarity with software and modeling and simulation, even if it's just on an Excel spreadsheet. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep my talk informal, but when you have to have it prepared for a webinar, that's, uh, it needs to be a certain amount of structure to it. So, uh, so my, uh, get this one right. Oh, well, there goes that one. Hit in for next. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start, introduce myself a little bit and uh, my textbook, Mining Economics and Strategy and what's in that. The, the bulk of my talk will be on some, a couple of examples of applied economics and uh, alerting you to some of the things that we do now and th some of the things that maybe what we do uh, could be done better. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about a little bit about using economics as a bridge between technical people well, one, you know, say mining engineers and processing people that are all between technical people and management of, of the company. And I'm gonna also introduce a couple of examples on how we deal with uncertainty. Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I was uh, born in Gympie and my father was a metallurgist and our family was involved in retreating gold tailings using cyanide to recover the gold. And that was in the 1950s. And as with any retreatment business, the reserves are finite and ours were running out and uh, until there was a big flood on the Mary River and uh, that finally sealed our fate for that business. And I say our, because, but I was only a kid. Uh, but you know, mining's one of those industries that kind of gets in your blood and your bones. And uh, for our gold retreatment business, we'd been mining our own limestone. So when the gold ran out, we were in the limestone business, uh, supplying ground lime for uh, uh, fertilizer and glass manufacturer, uh, calcine lime for sugar mills and foundries and, and some hydrated lime. So that's what I did every weekend when I was growing up, you know, charging up the calciner. But Although we didn't call it a calciner then, it's just a big vertical kiln fired by wood. Not exactly carbon neutral, but this was in the 1950s and 60s. I did my undergraduate here at University of Queensland in mining engineering. So I'm a mining engineer. So spoiler warning for you mineral processing metallurgy people. Later in my talk, I've invented a couple of uh, mineral processing examples. So uh, if I haven't got it quite right, you've got to cut me some slack. Uh, after graduation, I worked at the Saraji mine in central Queensland. I worked for the coal division for Shell in the Netherlands. Well, there aren't any coal mines in the Netherlands, but we were working on projects in Australia and Indonesia and South Africa. I worked for a mining contractor in the UK uh, called Miller Mining, and they had five pits in uh, Yorkshire, Lancashire and Scotland. I've always been passionate about using computers to solve uh, mining problems. So I started a company, uh, Rungi Limited, in 1977, focused on computer applications in mining. And the company's now called RPM Global Holdings Limited, and I'm just the, the R part. And the business is a mixture of uh, consulting and advisory work and software for mining. And I, but I retired from the board in 2018 after 41 years, and now I'm just a 
investor, albeit with residual emotional attachment. Well, that's until they do something wrong and then I'm out of here. And now, now I just want to deviate a little bit from my introduction uh, to talk a little bit about writing software. And I'm sure quite a lot of you people are involved in doing exactly that, and particularly simulation software. And why I'm such a supporter of this endeavor, which I think is about the highest technical art form we have in the world today. Take a bow, those people doing that. If you try to write a computer program to simulate something like a shovel or truck or drag line, which is what we did, or I'm sure that's the same whether you're simulating comminution or flotation, you end up learning so much more about that thing than you ever conceived. The first simulations might work uh, on some narrow set of conditions that you first were looking at, uh, but as soon as you try them to apply them into some other set of conditions, it'll fail. You discover something you thought you understood was just a narrow subset of some much bigger issue. So you go back to the drawing board, rewrite it, and the next rewrite will expose some other shortcoming in your logic or in some data requirements or something. You keep going until you get it right. And as I said, you end up learning much more about that thing than you ever conceived. And that's what the case with us in the early days of uh, Run Limited. Uh, our focus was on three main areas. Uh, simulation of mining equipment, trucks, shovels, drag lines. You might have heard our most notable product out of that time was uh, called Talpac, truck and, lo truck and loader productivity analysis and costing. And we've got some variations on that now. Uh, our second area was in mine scheduling. And our most notable product there was called XPAC, still is. We've got some variations on that now called Exact, which is, which is medium-term planning, and Execute, which is uh, short-term planning. And uh, the third area was financial modeling, uh, particularly for budgeting, equipment replacement analysis, uh, economics. And that product's called Xeris. The E-R-A-S is equipment replacement analysis originally. Now, as a result of being so heavily engaged in this simulation of modeling, we ended up knowing more about these things than just about anybody. So in 1984, I started presenting professional development courses in these fields, uh, including mine economics. It was a way to sell our software and consulting services for sure, but it was also a way, or at least my attempt, to move the industry away from the old rules of thumb uh, way of making choices into one based on science, technology, and economics. And you'll hear that term rules of thumb quite a bit over the rest of my talk. Which brings me back to economics. When you analyze something, simulate something, what are you trying to achieve? What's your objective function? Is it optimizing productivity or optimizing yield? Well, optimizing productivity or yield will only get you halfway there. You know, how can you compare, say, a 15 cubic meter loader with 130 ton trucks against a 25 cubic meter loader and its fleet of 230 ton trucks? The two systems have totally different capital and operating costs. And if you keep following that logic, it'll invariably lead you to conclude that your objective function is actually an economic one, an economic alternative. That's what the company wants. In the case of trucks and loaders, what the company really wants is the cheapest way to move the dirt. They don't care what your truck match is or how many passes it takes to fill a truck. All they want is the cheapest way to move the dirt. Now, in a processing plant, usually people are after maximising the yield. Uh, and actually, that's a pretty good proxy for economics because maximum yield probably equates to maximum revenue. Uh, but what about the processing cost? Froth flotation might give you the highest yield, but if a simple jig will give you nearly as good a yield and have much lower operating and capital costs, then that might be a more economical alternative. Now, in the, in the pre-computer days, Many of these things were virtually impossible to calculate. 
we had to use rules of thumb as a proxy for economics. Now that's not the case. So this is the foundation for my move from being primarily a technical boffin to a different kind of boffin, economics uh, focus, applied economics. Uh, uh, by, by the early 1990s, having been through several industry booms and busts, I was disillusioned with the application of economics in the industry. Actually, on the technical side, the production people, I think we'd made some good progress. But on the management side of the industry, their report card was a C minus. Now, I was going to talk a bit about that, but it got to be pretty negative, and I don't like to finish my talks on negative, so you can ask me the questions later. Anyway, to cut a long story short, in 1993, I, uh, I was at age 40. I took four years off and completed a PhD in economics and uh, then sat down and wrote my book, Mining Economics and Strategy, which was published in 1998. And then another two years to write my book, Capital Un Uncertainty, which was published in the year 2000. Now, Capital Uncertainty, you've probably not heard about. It's not a textbook. It's an economics reference book on rational decision-making for choices under uncertainty, particularly pertaining to large capital investment decisions, such as the decision to start up a mine or not. Which brings me to where we are today. My mining economics book was essentially made up from two professional courses that I had been presenting. The text was quite coal focused, quite open pit mining focused, and directed mainly at mining engineers, not geologists or process engineers. And over the time, the book has become the biggest selling textbook that the SME publish, but it's also found its way onto the desks of a lot of people who were never really in my target audience, such as mine accountants, a few mineral processing engineers, suppliers to the industry, and people in government regulation wanting to know a little bit about economics of the mining industry. And I figured that's a, a, a lucrative area to work on because I don't know how much they know right now, so anything we can do has got to be a help. So I'm, I'm in the process of rewriting it with specific introductory chapters at people who don't actually have a technical background in the industry, as well as examples from a wider cross-section of the industry, underground mining, more metalliferous examples, mineral processing. And I'll be also including some of my text or revised text from my capital and uncertainty book involving mining decisions where there's Risk. So after today's talk, I hope to get some additional examples from your areas to mix with my examples from the book. Now, that all sounded like a, a long introduction. Uh, so let me take you through a first really simple example illustrating the importance of applied economics to all of our technical decision making. I was scanning Wikipedia last week and came across this entry on Kosovo. I don't know anything about Kosovo. Uh, it says that Kosovo is rich in lignite, implied by their large reserves and presumably low stripping ratio of only 1.7 to 1. What, what, what does that mean? In the Hunter Valley, the stripping ratio is typically around 7 to 1. So, you know, you, we, we're using stripping ratio as a proxy for economics. And from this, you'd be inclined to think that the Hunter Valley coal is sort of economically worse or more costly to mine by a factor of 4.1 to 1. But is it? When you, well, when you're mining, you not only have to mine the waste, but you have to mine the coal as well. And there's, and there's a cost to that. And a tonne of coal probably costs as much to mine as about a cubic metre of waste. So, so a, a slightly better uh, if you're going to use a primitive indicator like strip ratio, a slightly better one would be the waste plus the coal divided by coal. So, and um, in which case you have got 2.7 in Kosovo and 8 to 1 in Hunter Valley. And so Kosovo is only on that measure three times better than the Hunter Valley. But wait, 
the calorific value of the Hunter Valley coal is 7.8 megajoules per kilogram. Uh, Hunter Valley is three times that much. And after all, it's those megajoules are really after, not the tons. So if we, uh, if we have the uh, waste plus coal divided by megajoules, we find that on a calorific value basis, cost of tons are no, no better than the Hunter Valley. And if there's transportation involved, those cost of tons are even more disadvantaged because they are three times more expensive to transport on a megajoule basis than is the Hunter Valley coal. So we, we use strip ratio as a proxy for economics because it's easy to calculate. Uh, but like many rules of thumb that are a hangover from the past, the imprecision of the rule is no longer tolerable considering the ease of calculation of the real thing. Uh, I wrote a paper in 1988 for a conference in Canada said strip ratio, an outdated indicator of economic value. Don't get me wrong, we do need rules of thumb from time to time, but we need to be satisfied that they are a good proxy for the real thing that we're after. If the mine is simple, like this uh, single scene drag line mine, then strip 12 will have a higher stripping ratio than strip three, and you can be confident that strip 12 is less economic than strip three, fair enough. The rule of thumb stripping ratio is a reasonable indicator, or at least a relative indicator. Well, in fact, it's not even that. It's a fair rank ordering indicator of economic value. Uh, we persist in using outdated rules of thumb, such as stripping ratio, because, well, we don't always have the time to sit down and work out the correct comparative number. Oh, well, we might be lazy, or maybe we love doing technical calculations, but we don't like doing economics. Or maybe we don't know how to calculate the correct economic number to use for our assessments. So this is actually what my um, mining economics book is all about. It sets out the tools for technical people to apply good economics to each choice we make. And I'm talking economics 101 economics, not PhD economics. It's dead straightforward. We should be doing it. Firstly, the computational effort to work out the economics is much less now than it was in the past. Secondly, mines in the past were invariably simpler, like that simple drag line mine. So uh, some short form rule of thumb was arguably not so imprecise compared to the real economic number if we had have calculated it. That's less so the case today. And thirdly, some of these rules of thumb that we continue to use are just plain wrong. So let's move on to a, another simple mine case study. Simple in, in, in that it's easy to understand, but an illustration of how, if we aren't on top of the economics, we can get it quite wrong. So this is a cross section of a multi-scene coal mine, typical of those in the Hunter Valley. Mining is straightforward. You excavate the waste from the left-hand side and, uh, and dump it on the mined out pit on the right-hand side, advanced, advancing down dip, uh, one strip at a time and rehabilitating the ground behind you as you go. Now, this example has a 10 to one stripping ratio for all five scenes. If you had a choice, you would, would you mine all five seams? Or is there scope to maybe only mine uh, the, the upper two seams, perhaps leaving the rest for later underground mining? Well, using the strip ratio calculation, there's no way to differentiate between these seams. But as I've, I've already pointed out, strip ratio is only a poor indicator of economic value. For example, the waste ab above the lowest seam only has to be dumped in the bottom of the adjacent mined out pit. You might even be able to use a drag line. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be much lower cost waste than the ones you 
moving to uncover the top seam, which has to be haul a much greater distance across the pit and raise a much greater height. So let's start thinking, how can we apply some economics to these calculations? If we had a good accounting system, the tracked waste moved by seam horizon, I could work out the cost or it should tell us the cost on a seam by seam basis. Well, here's what it would look like. Uh, it would show that the coal from the lower seam is the lowest cost to mine. Is that a reliable number? Well, it comes from your accounting system, so it should be. But I think as everyone, as everyone recognises, the numbers from an accounting system are seldom useful for planning purposes. To make mine any planning decision, any forward-looking decision, your choices have to be based on uh, one plan that you might do from now and into the future compared to some other plan that you might do. And once you've chosen and implemented one such plan, you'll, you'll have the accounting data for that plan, but you'll never have accounting data for the alternative plan that you never did implement. So costs for an economist are something that informs decision-making. They're not some historical thing incurred. And if I want to imagine you running this mine, or maybe accountant in your company is insisting you've got to cut some costs in your operation. He could look at, he could look at your accounting figures. If I want to have a cheap shot of any accountants here. Okay, that's good. Uh, if I want to have a cheap shot at accountants, I can imagine someone saying, well, we could significantly improve the economics of this mine by only mining the lowest seam. And it's easy to see the shortcoming here. Uh, if we only mined the upper seam, we wouldn't have to haul that waste all the way to the other side of that big pit. We'd be jump, dumping it in the uh, pit right adjacent because that's, that's where we'd be. Uh, its cost would be much lower than what our accounting system shows our cost to be here. Um, and that's the cost that we need to think about as applying to that upper seam that has to inform our choice for that. We could work out the real cost of mining a second seam the same way. We have to plan the entire mine as a two seam mine, subtract from that total cost, the total cost of a mine plan predicated on just the uppermost seam. And the difference is the real cost of mining seam number two. That is the marginal cost is the change in total cost and it's the marginal costs that we must use in deciding whether to mine that second seam or not. And we must continue in that way for all of the seams. So this concept of marginal cost is vital for any economic analysis. Understanding marginal cost is the key to deciding just about anything, whether it's the various mining alternatives or the split between fines and costs in a processing plant or anything else. Here's the key though, the marginal cost can't be measured. You can't get it from your accounting system. It has to be calculated. And the great news, finally, we have computer power enough to do these calculations, which is what I've done here. I've considered five different scenarios, a one seam mine, a two seam mine, a three, three up to five seam mine. I calculated the total cost for each alternative, and I determined the marginal cost being the change in total cost between each of those alternatives. And the results, as you would expect, show that the top seam is indeed the cheapest to mine. Uh, indeed, it's 19% cheaper to mine than the lowest seam, whereas the accounting system suggested it was 12% more expensive. So we have five seams with the same strip ratio based on reliable accounting data, mining costs decline as we go deeper. But as a guide for mine design, that's a complete bum steer. The cost, the marginal cost increases as we go deeper. This is a really simple example. 
But I'm sure you can see how, without computers, calculation of these marginal costs is almost impossible. What if the value or coal characteristics of those seams were different? They, all, they will be. Maybe some of them were coking coal and some thermal coal. Do you think it might impact the design of your processing plant? If some mining guy stuffs it up here and you haven't got figures there, you're going to design the plant for one kind of coal or the other? It makes it hard to change the plan afterwards when you've built the plant. Uh, how might this look in the real world? Here's actually a, 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 here's actually a cross section from anyone recognize this? It's uh, from Tavern Tolgoy in Mongolia, designed, prep plant there designed by Sigmund. Does that look at all familiar to that last diagram I just had? Well, in this case, the target seam was one in the middle of the sequence. I think it, it was coking coal, whereas the lower seams were, um, uh, were less valuable. Of course, not mining these lower seams and on the way through meant that all the waste had to be hauled out of the pit and that adds some cost. But that's a story for another day. Uh, so what, I'm, what I want you to draw out from this example uh, and, and this sort of concluding a main part of my presentation, um, and I hope gives you a flavour of what economics can do for us and how it, it's going to can make a huge difference if what we're doing now is old rules of thumb that haven't uh, been tested. And so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, two takeaways from this. I think, first of all, rules of thumb. No matter what they are, you must put them on trial for their life. Many of them are outdated. Some of them are just plain wrong. And even the ones that are still relatively good can probably be improved with small computational effort. And marginal cost. My mining economics and strategy book is full of marginal cost examples and my new version will have even more. The takeaway from this is you can't measure marginal cost. You have to calculate it. This marginal cost idea is important. And it's, only, it's economics 101. Uh, mind you, I think a lot of economic schools probably don't address this as much as they should. So if this is new to you, then please uh, take it on board. Don't pass go until you've collected your $200 worth of marginal cost. Well, with increasing complexity in mining comes increasing value in better interaction between different technical professionals and between technical professionals and management personnel. And economics provides a unifying tool for cross-disciplined approaches to achieve these outcomes. So here's an example. Uh, the interface between mining production people and processing plant personnel. Mining, I don't want to giving away a dirty secret here, but mining production personnel, classically, we can solve dilution and contamination problems easily just by sending more diluted and contaminated ore to the processing plant. I've heard it multiple times from mining production people. Hey, that's what we've got a processing plant for. Yet in a saving in mining cost might result in a much higher cost in the processing. If the processing plant is not designed to handle the feed characteristics, then the throughput might be reduced. The cost of processing the dilution and contamination might be significant or it might not. But if the throughput is reduced because of the dilution and contamination, the, low, the lost revenue might be many times this. If the processing plant is designed in the first place to handle the different feed characteristics, then this will be a higher capital cost for sure. But how significant is this in the overall economics? The impact of the higher initial capital costs may well be less than the additional mining cost of trying to reduce contamination at the mine face, particularly if the mine face is underground, in the dark and very constrained. One thing's for sure, 
a heated argument between the mine manager and the processing plant manager at the daily production meeting won't solve the problem. Economics can. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with just a couple of examples, I think, of, the, of what I'm looking for. I'm not going to sort of give you anything definitive here, but I want to float a, a few ideas uh, that uh, which some of which will be in my new book. But if they're issues that you're wrestling with, then um, my email's on the at my website or on there, uh, send me an email. So, uh, but this is a, a, a problem uh, that occurs in many industries, but none more acutely in mining. It has to do with uncertainty. Some uncertainties you just have to deal with. Some uncertainties can be resolved by expenditure on more drilling, uh, sampling, pilot plan testing. And some uncertainties can't be resolved regardless, like the future price of the commodity you're selling. Uh, now, take for example, you're designed, charged with designing a processing plan, particularly the fines processing. And from preliminary studies, we, we learned that our expected 18% uh, of our feed is gonna to report to the fines. Well, we clearly don't design our fine circuit just to handle 18% of our feed rate. But what, what capacity do you design for? Do you design for covering 75% or 90%? In this example, I've, I've drawn the uh, suggested rate at the 90th uh, percentile there. And, uh, but you can, you can use economics to work that out. If you're... First of all, let's assume we are totally confident about that distribution. Um, then the rate to design the fine circuit at is actually quite simple, conceptually at least. You'd look at the marginal cost. Here's a, here's a whole economic mouthful, so get ready to digest. You would look at the marginal cost of processing each increment of in based on the extra cost of the extra in install capacity and consider the marginal return uh, from, the, uh, from the additional tons you get and you would design at the rate where the marginal re return equated to the marginal cost. That's pretty simple, a big mouthful, but I said simple and I meant conceptually simple from an economic perspective, the calculations would probably be very complex. And, and your design obviously can incorporate whatever you want in it, uh, feed stockpiles or whatever you like. But this is assuming you know the characteristics of the distribution, like owning a casino. There is variability, but you deal with it. The economics field actually has some quite good tools uh, for dealing with this kind of a problem, where the uncertainty can be expressed in some probabilistic way. But in mining, we're seldom dealing with variability whose characteristics are known. We're dealing with nature's ore bodies. And if we spent more money on drilling, sampling, pilot plant testing, we might be able to reduce our expected variability. Uh, but now with, ex with less expected variability, we can potentially achieve our 90% design capacity with, uh, with a lower uh, throughput or a lower design capacity. The savings in plant design might be significant, but how do you trade off the benefit of or savings in the plant design against the additional cost of drilling, testing, and sampling? Um, because you spend more money doing more drilling and testing and sampling, the distribution may not change, or the, the median won't, probably won't change, it might even get worse. Uh, it only changes your confidence in the shape of the distribution. So this is one of the big problems we have in mining economics. We can spend money to reduce uncertainty, but a mine plan prepared on the basis of less uncertainty isn't necessarily any better. Um, from an NPV perspective, it's probably could even be worse by the amount of money we've just spent on the extra sampling and drilling and testing. And I don't know of any mining company that uses different discount rates based on any quantitative measure of uncertainty. You think of the process of discovering a potential mine and gradually proving it up. For example, 
a mining company might own some promising but early stage exploration areas in some mineral rich province. You could conceptually pray, portray the value or return on investment like this, a potentially high return, uh, but potentially uh, lots of, but lots of uncertainty. And note, note that the project fails not when the return on capital investment is less than zero. It fails when the return on capital is less than the cost of capital. And projects like this one, at this stage of our knowledge, if we wanted to start it, the cost of capital will be very high. The process that ultimately leads to commitment is one of successive rounds of evaluation. Maybe there's too much risk, the, the shaded area for this project at this stage, but we can spend a small amount of money on exploration, for example, to reduce the uncertainty. Each successive round of evaluation costs more and more money. And ex ante, at least, before we go into it, it's only going to reduce the expected return on investment by the cost, by at least the cost of doing that work. But as the project gets better understood, the cost of capital will also go down. Till finally, hopefully, you'll have an acceptably low proportion of outcomes in the shaded area while uh, still having an expected return that competes favorably with anything else you might invest in. In this model and during this process, the focus is almost wholly on that shaded area. Well, I guess if you didn't have an expected return early on that wasn't, that was too low, well then, you're not going to get much of a budget to do more work. But assuming you've got some expectation of a good return, all of the focus, all of our focus as technical people is, is on that shaded area. The and that's the probability of an outcome whose return on capital is less than the cost of capital. Now I call this the uncertainty criteria. Any focus on expected return only happens after the uncertainty criteria is satisfied. Now, the boards of exploration companies are totally familiar with this process. They make judgment calls every day about whether it makes sense to spend some more money on exploration versus the probabilities of either finding a better ore body or refining the knowledge that they know about some existing ore body. The boards of mining companies are quite different. In my experience, they, they know bugger all about risk, actually, but in my experience, they implicitly assume when major projects are presented to them, the technical people have already done their work and the probability of the project ending up in that gray area is already acceptably low, at least from a technical perspective. If it's not, the, the project, comes with some sort of audit review by some outsiders so that the board doesn't actually think about that. They've got other things to think about. Mining projects still fail, of course, quite some of them quite spectacularly. In the last two decades, there have been many case studies to draw from. It's a particular interest of mine, but as I said, that's not a high note to leave the talk on. So I'll leave this discussion, that discussion for another day if you invite me back. And I'll stop there and have, invite some questions. Okay, um, Neville's given me the uh, given given me the task of managing the questions. So um, we have two different potential sources of questions. We have a, a, a an audience here. And uh, I'll just please ask anyone in the audience, if you have a question, put your hand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. And meanwhile, we don't ha currently have questions in the Q&A, but there was one point in the chat while, um, while we're, and this came early in the talk, so it may have been addressed, but I'm too stupid to realize whether it has or not. Um, early on, uh, one person made the comment that, maximum yield doesn't equal maximum revenue. Uh, 
So while you're, uh, if you want to address that question in then, then or that, that comment, then I'll leave it to you. In the meantime, if anyone has a question here, I'll bring you the microphone. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's totally correct. I mean, it's probably pretty close in a lot of cases, but you can maximize your yield maybe by um, reducing your grade quality or something like that, for sure. Dan, uh, Brett Garland uh, from the Mining Industry Safety and Health Centre. Um, unfortunately, some of those case studies you'll mention at your uh, next talk and more likely a couple of my projects um, uh, whilst I was operating mines. But the question is, uh, you've covered the, the mining economic side of it today. Um, and economists like mining engineers are often pretty maligned, but economists usually end up in politics. And therefore, when you're looking at a, the life of a mine, and the policy changes and the legal changes over the life of that mine, the economic uncertainty that they bring to a project, how do you bring those into your modelling and try to um, keep in that unshaded area? Ah, uh, that's a good question. And, uh, and I think it's, a, it's sort of, it's the same kind of question if, uh, you know, we expected the price of copper to be X now and it turns out to be lower than that. What do we do? And I think, uh, uh, oh, actually, I think you can predict some prices better than we do. Not, not real well, but and and I think you can almost predict some of those policy changes as well. Or at least you can be alert alert to a scenario like that. And uh, one answer to that is. When you're planning a mine, or when I say a mine, I mean the, the plant or anything else about it. Uh, what, one of the things we've got to learn is the mines that had scope to change have handled that much better than the ones that haven't. So I say to people, okay, we're planning this mine. Are we are we shaving the last dollar? And is the one of the prices we're paying is our inability to change. And um, and I think um, and and that might 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 be a choice of what we're doing in the mine. It might be a characteristic of the deposit. Um, for example, uh, there was a a nickel mine in West Australia. And I'd done some work on it, and I'd said to the company, uh, this is not a goer because there's just not enough reserves there. So if something happens, there's nowhere to go. For this mine to work, everything has to fall into place. Uh, and uh, it's a long story, but the company started and it failed, and they wrote off a couple of billion dollars. And whilst they didn't, they didn't blame that for the issue, they blamed the lower nickel price. But in fact, uh, a, a, a mine developed on a different kind of deposit that allowed a more scope to change wouldn't have been hit with, uh, with what we got. And, and, you know, you can see it. Uh, there's a high price of something. Uh, Price falls down, the company gets into cost-cutting mode, they fire everybody there who's not involved in production, including the planning people, and they reduce their inventories in the pit uh, so that they haven't got enough scope to blend that type of ore with this kind of ore, and then next minute the market require some other change and they don't have the scope to do it. And not only that, they don't even have the personnel needed to replan the mine to know how to do it. And the next minute they're caught out and, you know, something bad happens. Uh, so I think the answer, one answer to that question is, uh, we don't, in our planning, we don't have a good mechanism to value mines that have got scope to change ahead of minds that have less scope to change. Yeah. Okay, we've got a flood of questions online. So I'll do another, I'll do an online question then we'll move to another one in the audience. Um, so the first one that came in online was, 
We'd love to hear your comments on building planning for mine closure and mine rehab into marginal costs. Ah, yes, that's a, oh, well, that's a challenging question. Uh, thank you for that question. Well, I'm just to stall another minute while I think of a good answer. Um, I, I think uh, um, every plan that we uh, do nowadays, we take into account mine closure costs. But if you're doing a discounted cash flow and the mine's got reserves for 48 years, the present value of a lot of that is nothing, or the present cost of, what, of that. And a lot of people are uneasy about that because it, it essentially, if that's the way you're thinking, it, it doesn't, doesn't change what you're doing now. Um, uh, well, in one sense, there's some correctness in that actually, but it doesn't happen till then. You've got, when the mine is operating, you can do a lot of things in the interim. And if, particularly if you've got time to, if you know it's going to close in 10 years, and you get a lot of work because you're moving a lot of material around for those last 10 years, you can, you can do a lot to it. So my experience is that those costs are not, you take into account, they're not that high so long as you know about them in advance and plan around it. It's when someone changes the rule on you and you have to do it now, then all of a sudden you find you're in a $500 million, you know, uh, write down because of some valuation change. Um, Incidentally, this is uh, another thing about that we don't look at with uh, with uh, a lot of mine plans is we we plan mines as if it's going to keep ticking over, and we don't put a lot of cognizance on the issue of if it stops ticking over. So, for example, if the mine is keeping on going, well, then it's easy to do that rehab because you've got truckloads of material every day to fill it in. If the mine doesn't keep, tick over, then the cost of doing that rehab in a non-operating mine might be millions. I was involved in a mine in central Queensland where that happened. Uh, the accountants had made provision for about a million dollars of rehab costs under the assumption that, uh, that uh, the mine was going to keep going. And then uh, when it closed down, a new, bought by a new owner, the old owner, had that provision on their book, so they guaranteed that rehab, but then they discovered that that new owner wasn't going to mine that part of the mine anymore, and the rehab cost was like seven times. So, yes. Um, uh, let me also tell you, you know, when I worked in the UK, this mining company, uh, we we actually had a, a, a final void, and it was only a short-term contract, four or five years, so we knew we'd have a final void, but... Keep in mind that that final void, the company made more money out of that final void than they did in the mining because it was a established area and there's nowhere else in that established area for disposal of garbage and crap. And so it was actually a very profitable thing having a final void. And I think if you're in established areas, some of those things that are, we think of as liabilities can actually be assets. Hope that answers the question. Ian Marcin Zemsky from, um, from JKMRC. And I think this is partly linked to, the, to that previous question. What's your, what are your thoughts? You mentioned economics a few times and the, the power of it and that we should be careful and, and apply it well. What are your thoughts on the application and use of NPV as a measure for mining decisions? Uh, is it valid? Is it something that is the only way to go, or is it something that we should relook at, especially given the fact that these mines often go for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and NPVs only actually gives you an insight into the next five to 10 years? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, should we use NPV, or, or there are some other measures, and to what extent does uh, the NPV not really properly consider some other issues because of the too far in the future, discounted. First of all, I, I won't get into arguments of NPV or IRR or those. Frankly, if you can give a project to go ahead or not go ahead on the basis of one difference or the other, then don't do it. Mining projects need to be pretty clearly a goer. 
Otherwise, don't do them. That's what my experience is. The companies I've been involved with that have tried to refine those numbers and argue about NPV or internal rate of return, they've lost the plot. It has to be a good thing, uh, make sense, uh, rather than any academic argument on IRR or NPV. But you've got a, a valid point in the sense that some of these things are worth looking at more than we look at them. Like what discount rate do we use? Well, um, you know, if you're up in central Queensland and want to start a coal mine and you've got a huge history of, uh, of, of mining and the technology and your, it's one mine and your company's already got six other mines, then that's a whole different thing than if you want to start up a graphite mine in, in uh, Gamaroon. So um, we have no good mechanism to say, well, the discount right here should be 8% and over there should be 15 Where do those numbers come from? I don't know anyone who's got any kind of uh, mechanism to quantitatively do that. Um, also, I think there's an issue too, is that things that happen sooner have less risk than things that happen further down the track. But we use the same discount rate. We shouldn't, you know, if you want a, 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 a loan, if you've got to you know, invest in government bonds and, you, and it's a five-year rate or a 30-year bond, the rate on the 30-year bond is higher than the five-year bond. Therefore, the marginal rate of stuff further out is much higher than the marginal, than the rate stuff further in. So stuff further out needs to have a higher discount rate than stuff closer in. I don't know anyone that uses differential rates as a function of time out. Same with things like, oh, well, uh, depreciation allowances, which gives you tax benefits. I mean, there's no risk in those. They should be discounted at a low rate. I don't know anyone that uses differential discount rates for different elements of the cash flow, frankly. Some have played around with it, but no, I, don't, I don't know whether that answers your question. I will be looking in my new book, some of the talk about um, uh, investments based on, on different discount rates. Uh, is that covers it? Yeah. So we still got seven questions in the Q&A. I suspect we won't get to all of them. So I thought I'd jump straight ahead to one that's, that's, um, that's controversial, but probably topical, and that is, from an anonymous attendee, Ian, in your experience, what does the demise of the mining engineering profession mean to the industry? What is the demise of the mining industry, mining profession? It probably means that those who have still got the skills are going to get paid more. <laughs> That's the way an economist would work. Uh, I, I, I would. I would say the bigger question there is that um, we, it, in times past, the, the managing directors and the bosses of mining companies were people who grew up in the mine. They, they had done their time at the coalface. And so when, as a manager, they're called upon something, they had some of that gut feel. I think the manage, management now in the big mining companies has almost none of that. And I think a lot of the, what I consider to be um, ill-informed decisions are an outcome of that. They go to Harvard Business School or something and they learn business practices that, that don't take sufficient cognizance of the kind of risks and uncertainties that are in the industry that somebody who grew up in the industry did. Now, I, I think it's fair enough. In the past, we had senior people whose skill was production running their companies and often in not as business-like commercial way. So, But I think we've gone the other way. And the biggest area where I think we've suffered is in the area of risk. Uh, if you grow up in the industry, you have a gut feel of what the risk is. It would be great if we could quantify that better. And I'm hoping with my book, um, that's one of the things I'm doing, but 
the, at the end of the day, the buck stops at the very top. And I think uh, one of the uh, my recommendations for people who've, who've going through the mining schools is we need more mining people who've got that experience and get them, uh, you know, restore some of that balance at the very top of our companies so that the people there are uh, have got some of that uh, uh, time spent at the coal face. Thank you, Ian, for a wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Vladimir. I'm from JKMRC. Uh, this place is, is I mean, the, our small piece of jiggle, bigger picture is to improve the process, uh, either, uh, the process to, to improve efficiency. Uh, during the mining boom, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, decline of productivity. Uh, there some people were, uh, were uh, was talking that uh, we uh, stop mining smarter, or uh, or my question is, we 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 heard a lot about the the mining costs from from you and processing costs. What are your thoughts whether that decline in productivity in the past during the mining boom was uh, was due to uh, inefficient processes or it, or was it due to uh, financial decision to uh, increase the profits? Okay, so we're talking about efficiencies and in the boom, uh, it was lost less interest in that. And uh, so, you know, is there a real role for us? Uh, I, yeah, if you're an iron ore miner and it's costing you $18 a ton to put that ton on a ship and you're selling it for $120, then it's pretty hard for us to come along and say, well, we can reduce that $18 to $17.50 by better, you know, handling costs, isn't it? Um, and uh, so the focus then was only on tons. It didn't matter whether the 18 bucks went to 20 bucks or 30 bucks a ton if you're selling it for 100 bucks a ton and you can just get some more tons out there. Um, but then the bigger picture is this. I mean, this is the industry. It's always booms and busts. And when it goes down, they're not interested in efficiency then either. They're only interested in surviving. So if they're not going to focus on efficiency when the, in boom times, and they're not going to focus it on, they're only interested in cost cutting in the down times, then that doesn't leave much of a window, does it? Um, I, I think that's another artifact of our changing time where, you know, this centre was funded by Mount Isa Lions in JK's era when they recognised that there was some investment in long-term returns that they, and they, the people approving that investment were the, you know, MD of those companies and they understood where it would pay back. They could never do a DCF on their investment in the JK centre. Um, but uh, some of these things are not, you know, able to be put into a DCF any more than, some exploration company can go out there and put some drilling and have no clue whether they'll find something or not. Um, I, I think one of the outcomes of this uh, fact that our mining companies are run by professional managers without that mining technical background, it's hurt, it's hurt our industry, at least from a technical perspective. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question. Um, I, I think one of the hard things for us in this field of trying to improve technology, or in my case, better decisions, is that uh, if the company uses poor technology or makes a bad decision, often you cannot tell that ever that happened. You can't tell that they could have made some better decision. And I've been involved in a whole bunch of mines in my life 
where I thought, that's dumb starting that up. Um, and uh, um, and then, sure enough, something goes wrong, but they don't blame that issue that I said was dumb in the first place. It's something else has happened. The price of the mineral has gone down or something else has happened, but fundamentally they made a mistake, but it's never, ever tying that mistake to some piece of technology. Uh, maybe we've got to be marketing our skills uh, better. Um, don't have a long answer. That's about that's long answer. Sorry, that's a long answer. I don't have a better one though. Yeah. Okay, so we've got we, we we've gone a little over time, but I think there's a lot of good questions there. And as long as you're happy to keep going, we'll do one more from from online and one more from the audience, and then yeah, see how we I'm go on, to that. I'm on double time now. <laughs> yeah. um, so there are quite a few questions around this sort of risk and uncertainty and future changes and that sort of thing. But Perfect. there's one that I wanted to ask, and that is in in relation again in relation to mine closure, or uh, I think you could extend this to any event really. What do you think would be the impact, or or how would you treat the likelihood of a of a change of rules as an uncertainty in your economic decision making, and this is in relation to mine closure, but it could, I guess, unforeseen future events. Could it sink a project's viability to these sort of future developments that that you know that are beyond the scope of your assessment of the project? Um, yes, that's a good question. Uh, is the uncertainty of a likely future change in um, regulatory environment or something sink a project? I think uh, the uncertainty sinks more projects than, you know, if the regulatory environment said we're going to, you know, charge you X dollars per this, per that if you do this, um, that wouldn't sink as many projects as the uncertainty of not knowing what they would do. And you could use this example of travel in Australia with the COVID is we, we'd like to go to Melbourne or something to see some relatives, but if on the risk of like closing the border on you know three hours notice, we might have to do two weeks quarantine. We're not going to go to Melbourne, and it's not the regulation that's the problem. It's the uncertainty that stops us doing so many things, and I think that's uh, that's absolutely the case. I think uh, we start up a mine, we make a commitment, we've we can't, you know, if something goes wrong, if you've got, and this is where mining is quite a lot different than most other industries, is if, if you've got a car factory here and they change the rules on you, well, you know, you can sell the factory to make baked beans or something. Your, your at-risk capital is a lot less. But in mining, once you've sunk that shaft, uh, the second-hand value of it is nil. So the it's the amount of capital at risk in a mining case that's much more, not just the total amount of capital, it's the percentage of capital, the, most of it that's actually at risk. Uh, and in mining investment, a lot more of our capital is at risk and therefore the sensitivity to actually giving them the go ahead is much higher than a lot of other industries, um, you know, given, uh, given the uncertainty about some new regulation. Hey, thanks. My name is Claudia Moreno, and I'm a PhD student at SMI, and I would like to know if you have done any work, including environmental costs in the planning of the mines, uh, besides their rehabilitation costs. Um, I personally haven't done much of that because I haven't done much for a long time, but uh, I think every... We, we, we do a, a mine plan. Uh, we'll have an environmental element to that plan and we would always be taking cognizance of that um, actually amazingly you know, let me just not just say environmentally let's say you took my coal seam example there uh, there might be a thin seam of coal that's not economical to mine but I don't know many or any companies that actually will then, they will try and mine that because throwing it in the spoil is kind of wasting a valuable resource. And you see that repeatedly in mining companies where they'll, 
where they will um, make a deliberate choice. No, this is a, the proper thing to do for husbanding the world's resources or anything else. Now, and the price of whatever, copper plummets, um, and they're squeezed for cost, then some of those things might get squeezed. But I, uh, you know, I, I, I would rail against the notion that when we are planning mines, that we're sort of cavalier about those things. Anything but today. Uh, uh, now, the rules, I'm not saying we hire Greenpeace to come and, you know, set our environmental standards, but uh, every company I know is thinking really hard about something, and if it's not a rule, they're thinking, well, is this likely to be becoming the rule? And we're certainly taking that into account in Australia. It's not the case in other parts of the world.